My name is Mona Dreiser. I'm the Deputy Director at the Center for Global Security Research, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's CGSR seminar on the topic of the legality of nuclear deterrence. We invited Newell Highsmith, who served as an attorney at the U.S. Department of State and now currently teaches law and nuclear policy um, at the Georgetown University Law Center um, to think about a, a topic that we thought was really important, which is the legality of uh, nuclear deterrence. Um, in today's world, um, where the ban treaty, or I should say the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons has brought many of these issues to the forefront, we thought it was an important issue to consider. Um, he started the analysis and ultimately published a monograph in our CGSR series of Livermore Papers on Global Security. This is the sixth in the series, and I've brought copies here for those of you that might want to take a copy. You can also download um, this one and the previous five on the website, cgsr.llnl.gov. We have lots of other documents there that you might find interesting. Um, and so because the ban treaty um, has been more in the forefront in international security discussions, we thought that it would be important to do this type of analysis and consideration and that Newell would be the perfect person to do that kind of work. He served an as an attorney at the State Department for 30 years and has held positions as the Assistant Legal Advisor for Arms Control and Nonproliferation, the Deputy Legal Advisor for the Department, and served as a primary sole legal advisor for negotiations of the 1994 agreed framework with North Korea, the 2008 agreement for nuclear cooperation with India, and the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran. His extensive experience um, on a really broad range of issues really makes him an ideal person to think about this topic. He has worked on issues such as Syria's use of chemical weapons, the violations by Russia of their arms control obligations, nuclear testing in South Asia, the New START treaty negotiations where we ran into each other there, where I had a minor role and he had a major role, mm -hmm. um, and broad issues on array of U.S. sanction laws. His presentation will be about 45 minutes or so. That'll leave us time for questions at the end. We'll be on the record with a camera recording the proceedings until then, and then we'll go off the record for the questions. So join me in welcoming Newell Highsmith. Thank you, Mona, and uh, I want to thank Livermore for the support, that Lawrence Livermore for the support they've given me in uh, preparing the paper and making various presentations on it. Um, two years ago, 122 nations got together and approved the text of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. There were 69 nations that declined to participate in um, that negotiation, and that included all nine states that have nuclear weapons or, or rumored to have nuclear weapons, and almost all of their allies. The treaty has not entered into force, and only about half of the required 50 states have ratified or had ratified at least at the time that I was preparing the, uh, this paper. Um, the, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons was not drafted with a view to actually ending the, the possession of nuclear weapons, in my view. Um, it was drafted more, uh, it, it, various elements of it make it very unlikely that any of the states with nuclear weapons would ever accede to that treaty. Uh, it was drafted more as an effort to make a statement on behalf of those non-nuclear weapon states, those 122 states against the possession of nuclear weapons, against the continued reliance on nuclear weapons, and to begin a process of stigmatizing the, or, or continue a process of stigmatizing the possession of nuclear weapons. Because it, was, because it was not designed or there was not a high expectation that it would lead to accession by the states that possess nuclear weapons, it's very likely that the advocates for the treaty will pursue other avenues for trying to eliminate nuclear weapons in the world. And uh, that could include bringing a case to the International Court of Justice. And it was in consideration of that possibility that, that we embarked on, on this paper. The International Court of Justice has previously considered the issue of the legality of nuclear weapons. In 1996, 
it issued an advisory opinion on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons. Every one of the 14 judges on the International Court of Justice wrote a separate opinion. The final decision is seven to seven, but, the but because the presiding judge, the, the, the chief judge, ruled with the majority opinion, that became the opinion of the court. So as I said, only half of the judges joined in this, con in this conclusion, although some of those who dissented also agreed with it. And this is the basic finding that the court made, that the threat or use of nuclear weapons would generally be contrary to the rules of international law uh, in armed conflict. And I will refer to those sometimes as the law of war or international humanitarian law. There's sort of uh, uh, terms that are commonly used to describe those rules that apply in those circumstances. And secondly, the court said it could not definitively conclude whether the threat or use of nuclear weapons would be lawful or unlawful in a very narrow set of circumstances, extreme circumstances in which the very survival of the state was at stake. So I want to talk about three key elements of this, this core of the finding of the ICJ. The first is that it is indeed the law of armed conflict that was applied to, um, uh, that was applied in reaching the conclusion that use of nuclear weapons or threat of nuclear weapons would generally be illegal. And specifically, they, uh, it, the focus was on the principle of proportionality, which requires that, um, that the use of force should be uh, uh, the use of force should be proportional to the objective, the, mil the legitimate military objective that's being uh, sought. And secondly, that the attack must be able to distinguish between combatants and non-combatants. And these laws of war uh, arose, uh, or crystallized, I would say, in largely after World War II, and maybe even started crystallizing before World War II, but really came together after World War II. The second element I want to focus on is that one scenario that the court said it could not reach a conclusion on whether the threat or use of force of uh, nuclear weapons would be illegal, and that was this extreme circumstance of self-defense involving the survival of the state. And finally, I want to focus on the fact that the, the finding applied not just to the actual use of nuclear weapons, but the threat of use of nuclear weapons, and by covering the threat of nuclear weapons, it directly implicates the policy of deterrence, which the states that possess nuclear weapons have relied upon uh, throughout the nuclear era. Uh, before I talk about these three subjects, though, I want to talk a little bit about what the court did not find. The court acknowledged that there was no per se pro prohibition against nuclear weapons, no per se blanket ban on the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons. And it went through the three possible areas that could have created such a ban. Uh, one is a, treaties, and there is no treaty that bans nuclear weapons altogether. Um, UN Security Council resolutions can create binding obligations on all states, and the UN Security Council has not created a ban on nuclear weapons. And finally, customary international law. And the court found that there was no customary international law principle that banned nuclear weapons in all circumstances. So I want to take one second and talk about customary international law because that is indeed the focus that the court, uh, 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 that is the element that the court focused on. And it's also the element that has been um, uh, the focus of many of the other efforts to to ban nuclear weapons or to say that nuclear weapons are illegal. For example, the UN General Assembly has ruled, has stated a number of times in resolutions that the use of nuclear weapons would be contrary to international humanitarian law, which is built up in, uh, uh, built up through customary, what is called customary international law. So customary international law is much like the common law in a domestic legal s system. It is built up through the settled practice of states. So what is it that the states actually do? And secondly, that the states are, are um, acting in this way because they believe that they have a legal obligation to act in this way. So a court is going to look at that settled practice and look at the, 
at the statements and the, and the um, circumstances in which the states have acted in that way and determine whether this has indeed become uh, a rule of law that applies to all states as a matter of customary international law. So in that regard, um, what then is the settled practice of states? And my finding was that the, um, that the settled practice of states is that nuclear deterrence and the uh, possession of nuclear weapons is very well settled as permissible under international law, as a matter of customary international law. As I said, the states have relied on nuclear deterrence throughout the nuclear era. There are numerous treaties that are, in fact, premised on the fact that states will have, states possess nuclear weapons. Um, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty acknowledges five states that are permitted to have nuclear weapons. Um, uh, it, it, it defines nuclear weapon states as those who have detonated by a certain date, and that therefore includes the United States, Russia, China, the UK, and France. So that is a treaty that acknowledges legitimacy of possession of nuclear weapons, even, the, even in a treaty whose purpose is to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Now, that treaty also says that those nuclear weapon states are obligated to pursue negotiations on nuclear disarmament. So we do have, the nuclear weapon states do have an obligation to try to eliminate nuclear weapons, but that obligation has been in place since the treaty was negotiated in the late 60s and early 70s, and um, it, is a, it is an obligation to negotiate, not an obligation that actually says by a certain time frame you have to have eliminated your nuclear weapons. And therefore the NPT supports the idea of continued possession of nuclear weapons. Um, the same is true of the Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaties. They eliminate, they, they, the Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaties for Latin America, for Southeast Asia, for the South Pacific, et cetera, they prohibit the presence of any nuclear weapons in those zones, but they also have protocols in which the nuclear weapon states sign on and say, we will not use nuclear weapons against the states in those zones. So even though they're prohibiting nuclear weapons in a large geographical area, they are, by, by requesting the nuclear weapon states to, to pledge not to use nuclear weapons against them, they are acknowledging the existence and the continued possession of nuclear weapons. Um, the treaties, uh, some, of, some of those trying to persuade the ICJ to ban to, that, that nuclear weapons are prohibited cited all of the, the treaties that limit nuclear testing and limit nuclear stockpiles, but again, those treaties, in fact, reinforce the idea that there is, there are permissible activities involving nuclear weapons. None of them purport to ban nuclear weapons altogether. They do the opposite. And finally, even the Treaty on the Pro Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, while seeking to ban nuclear weapons altogether, it, though it ha they have provisions that, that for the nuclear weapon states to join the treaty, so they're acknowledging that there are states outside the treaty who have nuclear weapons and or, yeah, they are seeking to get them to join the treaty, but they, are, they have to acknowledge that those states have nuclear weapons. Moreover, uh, that, that treaty can't apply to non-parties and, and even when it comes into force, none of the states that have nuclear weapons are, are going to be parties to it, at least under the current um, circumstances. And finally, States know how, if states want to prohibit nuclear weapons, they would know how to do it. They've, they've, they've banned um, chemical weapons, they've banned biological weapons. Uh, those, we know how to draft treaties that ban weapons altogether, and there is no such treaty for nuclear weapons other than the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which does not have um, the relevant states as parties. Um, As I mentioned earlier, part of the requirement under customary international law is that states are not only following certain practices, but they're doing it because they believe they are legally obligated uh, to act in that way. And the, the, the states that have nuclear weapons have in fact done the opposite. Uh, the United States and, and many of the other nuclear weapon states take pains to 
make clear in their statements at the UN General Assembly, in the UN Security Council, and in other fora, uh, NPT review conferences, they, go, they are at pains to make clear that they do not view their possession of nuclear weapons as illegal, uh, and that, they, that their policy of nuclear deterrence is legally permissible. Um, so they, so we, the, the, the governments are very conscious of the need to make very clear that they do not view this as an obligation under international law. So, as I said, this, the, the court did not decide that there's a per se prohibition against nuclear weapons, but now I want to go back to those three elements that I identified earlier. Um, the first is that the law of armed conflict is indeed the, uh, the law that the courts found applicable. Every state that made a presentation to the court, including the United States and Russia and the other nuclear uh, weapon states that made presentations, they all agreed that the law of war does apply to nuclear weapons. It is not a category apart from other types of weapons. It has to be treated the same as conventional weapons in that regard. And for proportionality, the question is whether the expected harm from an attack would be excessive in relation to the military advantage that you expect to gain. And this is a way of limiting collateral damage. It doesn't say that there can be no collateral damage. It just cannot be excessive compared to the military advantage that you expect to gain. And uh, in terms of discrimination, or sometimes referred to as distinction, uh, again requires that you must, you must distinguish between uh, civilian and uh, combatants, and you cannot target, you cannot target non-combatants as such. And the words as such are critical because again, it doesn't prohibit collateral damage, it just is a, is a method of limiting it. That you, you have to be able to, to differentiate combatants and non-combatants and try to limit that collateral damage and absolutely cannot target civilians as such. Um, so I, I wanna look first at the question of the use of nuclear weapons and then I'll come back to the question of the threat of nuclear weapons. Um, in my view, the court reached the right decision in finding that the use of nuclear weapons would generally be illegal under international humanitarian law. I don't agree with a lot of what the court ruled, but that part I actually do agree with. Um, and specifically because of these principles of, of proportionality and discrimination. There are hypothetical scenarios that have been cited of, for example, using uh, nuclear weapons against ships at sea or against uh, forces that are in isolated places like a desert or something like that. Um, there's hypotheticals about using very small tactical weapons to destroy only a base, uh, a military base with minimal consequences to the areas around it. And there's no question that, that, that those hypotheticals are, uh, have a reality to them. Those are, those are things that are possible. but they are also hypotheticals. They are not, I, I, in my opinion, our, the, the nuclear forces of most of the states are not configured specifically for those types of very narrow uses of nuclear weapons. And in most realistic circumstances in which you, nuclear weapons would be used, it is very difficult to meet the, the requirements of proportionality and, um, and uh, discrimination. Uh, now, the Obama administration directed nuclear planners to come up with nuclear plans, nuclear use plans that would comply with the laws of war. And there's, some, there's a very interesting article by General Keller um, a, a, about the effort to, to accomplish that and the work that they did with lawyers to try to, to make sure that they were not targeting civilian populations per se with, uh, or as such, to use the, the legal language, they're not targeting civilian populations as such in our nuclear planning. Um, but even though I think those were sincere efforts and, and uh, uh, the, the people took those, those responsibilities seriously, I think that when you step back, nonetheless, in most nu realistic nuclear use scenarios, it's gonna be very difficult to meet those uh, requirements for a number of reasons. One is that, that as the court found, 
the use of nuclear weapons is, only, is probably only going to be justified in a very narrow set of circumstances, putting aside those hypotheticals of use of a, against a ship at sea and so forth. It's going to be a fairly narrow set of circumstances, and those are most likely to be circumstances of fairly grave risk to the country that's being attacked. So if, if those circumstances involve a grave risk to, uh, to your country, whether it's survival of the state or some other definition of that grave risk, uh, it's going to warrant a fairly robust response. And those nuclear use decisions are going to be made uh, most likely in very short, with very short time frames, uh, with very little opportunity to evaluate all the factors involved, and particularly very little opportunity to get lawyers involved to evaluate whether it meets international humanitarian law. Um, the risk is enhanced by the fact that when you look at the permissible targeting under proportionality theory, it covers not just the means of waging war and the um, uh, war waging capacity, such as missile, missile, uh, facility, missile um, factories and transportation lines, but also covers war sustaining capacity, which broadens the permissible targeting uh, uh, considerably. In addition to that, it's, there are theories under which you can target facilities that are not yet being used in any capacity related to the war, to, to, to your conflict, but that might be. So for example, an airstrip that's not being used currently to support the military, but that might be down the road, would be a permissible target. And so when you look at this, these broad targeting parameters that are permissible, under proportionality theory, at least as the United States and many other states interpret it, and you add that each one of those targeting parameters will have a certain amount of collateral damage uh, permissible under it, then you run a high risk that any nuclear exchange is going to result in uh, significant damage to, to the countries involved, if not destruction of their ability to function really as, as, a, as, a, uh, as a state. And there are theories of limited nuclear exchanges and use of limited use of tactical weapons. Uh, those, of course, carry a risk of escalation. Um, and what I generally come back to on the, on the question of use of nuclear weapons is, is the scenarios that we have posited for the primary functions of our nuclear weapons, which is to deter a nuclear attack. In those circumstances, the likelihood is that both the, the initial attack and the responsive attack are going to be very difficult to comport with international humanitarian law. And that responsive attack has to comply with the laws of war, even, it, even though the aggressor was the other side. So for example, if, if the US or some other nuclear weapon state suffered a significant nuclear attack, that had wide-ranging damage to the country and possibly rendering recovery of the country extremely difficult. Uh, that response, the, the question of doing a responsive attack by that country is also subject to the laws of war. And the, the laws of war do not include retaliation as a permissible basis for a, a, a legitimate military objective. Um, this is one of the hardest questions, I think, in this area, because if you look at uh, uh, Scott Sagan and some of his colleagues have actually done a study showing the attitudes of Americans on how we would respond to different kinds of attacks and whether nuclear weapons ought to be in that mix. And uh, the American public, surprisingly, um, it has a greater readiness to, to use nuclear weapons than I think that we then we assume most leaders would have, um, but a country that suffered a nuclear attack, I think, say, one or just a couple of nuclear weapons launched from North Korea, as an example, uh, the pressure to have a very significant nuclear response, I think, would be significant. And yet, you are supposed to figure out what is your legitimate military objective in doing that. It can't be just to retaliate. It can't be just to punish the North Koreans. Um, uh, 
Uh, and yet, I think the pressure to do that would be enormous. And so I think this is one of the most difficult issues um, in this area. Um, but while, I've, while in my view, it would, the use of nuclear weapons would be very difficult to, to, um, to justify in most scenarios under the laws of war, it's, it's very difficult is not the same as impossible. And so I think the court was right to, to, to conclude that the use of nuclear weapons would generally be uh, inconsistent with the laws of war, but not to conclude that it would in all circumstances. And that is essentially what the court concluded, that it, that it was not, it did not apply in all circumstances. So that brings us to, um, not, not ready for that one. Um, that brings us to the second point that I wanted to talk about, and this one is much more briefly, and that is the exception for survival of the state. So the court identified one possible exception, which is extreme circumstances of self-defense involving survival of the state. It provided no legal support for that, for carving out that exception. Um, it didn't cite any case law, it didn't cite any settled practice of states, it simply concluded this is an area where we can't reach a conclusion. And in addition, it's not even clear what survival of the state means. Does that mean um, survival of the state as an independent entity? Does it mean survival of the current government? Does it mean sur the very basic survival of the population itself? Um, and the, the consequences would be very different depending on which interpretation you take of that. Um, and in addition, by carving out this most extreme circumstance where, of survival of the state, uh, they have picked one of the circumstances in which a significant use of nuclear weapons might be justified. And therefore, the possibility of, of catastrophic harm to the other party uh, is, is most likely. And that seems inconsistent with the general tone of the court's ruling of, of general illegality of the use of nuclear weapons. So, um, the court would have been better off stopping at, at simply saying that we can't reach a conclusion that in all circumstances uh, uh, nuclear use would be illegal. It, it should not have, in my view, should not have tried to identify a single circumstance because it's ignoring other possible hypothetical circumstances in which the use of, legal, of nuclear weapons might be uh, compatible with the laws of war. And uh, taking that extra step served no purpose and was possibly uh, actually con confused the issue more than it was necessary. So that brings me to um, the third element of the um, of the court's ruling that I wanted to talk about. And that's the, that's the main thrust of my paper, which is the legality of nuclear deterrence. The court lumped in threat of use with actual use. And while on the surface that may seem uh, illogical, it's actually consistent with the uh, with international law, including the UN Charter. Um, so that being the case, if it concluded that the use of nuclear weapons would generally be illegal, um, that also applies to the threat of, of, of nuclear weapon, use of nuclear weapons and raises the question whether it is, that whether nuclear deterrence is equally illegal except under that very narrow set of circumstances that the court defined. Um, it's clear that the threat of use of nuclear weapons can violate the laws of war. If, for example, Russia threatened to use nuclear weapons against the Ukraine unless it ceded Crimea to it, <coughs> excuse me, that would clearly be uh, inconsistent with the laws of war. That would be a threat of use that was inconsistent with the laws of war because it is a, it is a coercive threat. It's trying to coerce Ukraine to, to, uh, uh, to compromise its sovereignty. It is a very specific threat and it's a very direct threat. It's not hypothetical somewhere down the road. It's a very direct threat. We're going to do this now unless you uh, cede Ukraine to us, uh, cede uh, Crimea to us. Uh, 
But I don't think that is a typical, uh, that, new, that is not a good description of nuclear deterrence as it is uh, practiced in its most important role, which is to deter nuclear attack by another state. And in my view, there's, these are the three elements that render nuclear deterrence, um, uh, that make nuclear deterrence different from that hypothetical of Russia threatening Ukraine. The first is that, it, it, that nuclear deterrence in its primary role is not coercive. It's not trying to persuade or force another state to do anything particular. It is trying to per persuade a state to refrain from doing something, uh, attacking with nuclear weapons that would in fact be illegal as an initial act. It's also nonspecific. It's um, uh, nuclear deterrence theory involves a wide range of options uh, from using a few tactical weapons up to launching all of our strategic weapons. And it also includes not responding with nuclear weapons at all. Nuclear deterrence is not one thing. It is a whole package of, of different options that make, uh, that make it very difficult to say it would be uh, legal or illegal in a particular circumstance. And finally, it's highly attenuated because it is contingent on uh, the, uh, the, the state being attacked by another state with nuclear weapons, and it's also contingent on uh, my state deciding it's going to respond with nuclear weapons. As I said, there's very possible that the response would be a non-nuclear response. And in this way, I think nuclear deterrence is not um, particularly distinguishable from conventional weapons. Um, states have standing armies to deter attack by other states. They station forces overseas to deter attack by other states. Sometimes states send their forces into conflict areas where they, they may be creating a significant risk of conflict, but again, they're doing it in many cases to deter uh, that other state from, from opening hostilities. All of these examples involve a contingent threat. It's a contingent threat just the same way that a nuclear deterrence is a con contingent threat. And in some cases, those examples are much more likely to prompt a, uh, the opening of hostilities than nuclear deterrence is. And yet you don't see those actions being evaluated as incompatible with the laws of war. Those uh, uh, development and stationing and, and, and build up of nuclear for, of uh, conventional forces as being incompatible with the laws of war. And the same should apply to nuclear deterrence. And in addition, any assessment of international humanitarian law of the laws of war um, as applied to nuclear deterrence would have to be based on specific facts. And as I pointed out earlier, the, the uh, nuclear deterrence is a non-specific threat. It is not one threat, it is many threats. To do a proper analysis, you would need to know what is the nature and scope of the attack that you're responding to? Um, what is the risk of further attack by that opponent that you might be trying to deter? Um, what are the number and type of weapons that you are going to respond with? And what measures might you take to minimize um, collateral damage? None of that information is available to make an evaluation of international humanitarian law in the concept of nu in the in the in the context of nuclear deterrence, and one of my former supervisors put this, I think, uh, much more succinctly than I have, um, by pointing out that it's difficult enough to evaluate hypothetical uses of nuclear weapons, much more difficult to evaluate hypothetical um, threats of that are based on inference and presumed intentions, and. As you read the literature, of, and particularly the, 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 the views of those who question the legality of nuclear deterrence, they frequently do make those kinds of assumptions. They assume that, any, that nuclear deterrence involves a massive response, a massive nuclear response, uh, which was sort of the standard understanding of mutual assured destruction between the, the U.S. and Russia during the Cold War, but maybe does not apply so well anymore. Um, and they, they also assume that even if it's not an all-out attack, uh, 
that any exchange of nuclear weapons will almost certainly escalate into massive, a massive nuclear exchange. And um, they also assume that the parties will be acting without any consideration of international humanitarian law, without any effort to minimize collateral damage. Um, and while these assumptions may be uh, useful in a conversation on policy grounds, they don't provide a basis for finding blanket illegality uh, of, the, of this policy of nuclear deterrence, a policy, as I said, the, the nuclear weapon states have relied on throughout the nuclear era. Um, finally, proportionality is weighed, must be measured against the wrongful threat that you are trying to deter. Um, proportionality does not mean that uh, if they attack with this size force, I can only respond with the same size force. It's measured against what your objectives are. And I think that is illustrated well by looking at the, the um, Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Iraq invaded Kuwait and took over the territory with a relatively modest use of force against the, the much weaker Kuwaiti forces. The, um, the US and its allies used considerably greater force to dislodge the, the, the Iraqi army, which was dug in in Kuwait, and to push it back across the borders and to do so in a way that prevented follow-on attacks. Um, because part of, what you're, part of your legitimate military objective is not just to respond, but also to prevent the recurrence of those kinds of attacks. And that was a completely legitimate and proportional response by the US and its allies. Um, even though uh, the, there's a, there was a great disparity in the actual force involved. And the same ought to be applied to nuclear weapons. Uh, in, in the deterrence context, maybe perhaps not in the use context, that would be very fact specific, but in the deterrence context, uh, the, there should be a permissible imbalance between the threat and the, and the uh, uh, the initial threat and the deterrent threat. So for example, we may be worried about a threat of some small number of nuclear weapons being launched by North Korea against the United States. It, it, it should be permissible, it should be viewed as permis permissible under, the, the, under proportionality for the US responsive threat to be considerably greater in force than what the, the, than the incoming threat from North Korea would be in order to deter them, to be effective in deterring them from actually launching such a threat. And again, my, my former colleague um, stated this very well um, in uh, looking in particular at an interesting example that has both <laughs> positive and negative elements to it. Um, during the uh, uh, first Gulf War in when the U.S. was invading, uh, was, was getting ready to push Saddam and his forces out of Kuwait. Secretary Baker issued a, uh, we'll call it a threat, to his counterpart in Iraq, saying, if, uh, if chemical weapons are used against our forces, you can expect the full uh, force of U.S., a, a fully forceful U.S. response. I'm paraphrasing. But the clear message was, if you use chemical weapons against us, um, then you can expect the possibility of a nuclear response. Now, the actual use of nuclear weapons in that circumstance might have been very difficult to justify under um, proportionality and discrimination. Um, but uh, Mike Matheson was making the point, why, is, why would the, the, the mere threat be illegal when its role is to deter an unlawful action by, um, by in this case, Saddam's regime. And this was, this was how he, he responded to that. So um, uh, to sum up, um, I am, I'm sympathetic with the cause of eliminating nuclear weapons. Um, I think it's disturbing that a handful of countries could, um, through uh, miscalculation or stupidity or arrogance uh, take actions that would lead to devastation of the planet or, or large portions of the planet. And it's disturbing even if, the, if such an outcome is not particularly likely in the current international security environment. Um, 
And, but that said, I, I think that uh, the current effort under the Treaty on the, no the Pro uh, Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is not an appropriate way to go about that. And we have to expect that the, the advocates for that position are going to pursue other uh, means of accomplishing their end. Uh, one, one means which would actually be um, uh, fairly reasonable would be to look at some of the proposals that have been made by uh, what are referred to as the four horsemen, uh, George Schultz, Henry Kissinger, um, uh, Bill Perry, and Sam Nunn. And they've made a, they have a whole list of suggestions of measures that could be taken to lessen the risk. The four of them are very concerned that uh, about, if not the actual intentional use of nuclear weapons, that there could be an accident or a grave miscommunication uh, in which a country like North Korea believes it's being attacked and, and launches nuclear weapons. Um, and that therefore measures, significant measures ought to be taken to minimize that risk. And they've come up with a number of proposals to move in the direction of the elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, and that would be a, 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 a reasonable way to proceed. But there's other possible avenues that the advocates for elimination could pursue. One would be to start boycotting businesses in, in, um, that are engaged in nuclear weapons uh, uh, design and production. This was the approach that was taken with the landmines. Um, when the landmines, the, the treaties banning landmines had not been uh, adopted by all of the relevant countries, uh, significant efforts were taken to, um, uh, to go after those companies that were involved in the manufacture and it, it put pressure on those companies uh, that, that proved effective. I, I don't think it's the, the same um, is likely to apply in the case of nuclear weapons, but it is something that, that is, a, is an approach that they might take. Um, a grassroots effort in, in NATO countries. Uh, there has always been a concern that if, if, if that some of the NATO countries are more vulnerable to public pressure on nuclear weapons possession and the, fa and the, the whole concept of NATO cooperation on nuclear weapons than, um, than other countries and that some of those might be uh, vulnerable and that, that could create cracks in the whole NATO uh, structure. Um, there have been suggestions by some that the, the NPT, because it does create that category of five nuclear weapon states that, are, that it acknowledges will continue to have nuclear weapons, that that, that is a discriminatory treaty. And the idea would be to put pressure on the, the, the states with nuclear weapons, obviously like the NPT, because it allows them to have nuclear weapons and, and says that all the other countries cannot. Um, and so it might put pressure on those countries to start undermining the NPT. S in some ways, it looks counterproductive to your effort to eliminate nuclear weapons, but they might want all the, all the focus to be on the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and not and, and buy, and, uh, take that tack. And then the last uh, possible option would be, uh, as I mentioned, a challenge in the, in the uh, ICJ. But I do think that if, it, if, the, if a case were brought to the ICJ, it would be um, wrong as a matter of law for the ICJ to find that nuclear deterrence is, is illegal. Um, oh, that's not. And, um, and I think um, in addition to being wrong as a matter of law, I think the court, sh it would be dangerous for the court to reach a decision that is simply incompatible with the facts on the ground, which are that um, uh, nuclear deterrence is a reality, and as long as states have nuclear weapons, it's vital that nuclear deterrence be effective. And, and in the current state practice is that states do rely on nuclear deterrence. I think it also would go beyond the court's mandate. It would be the court engaging in making law instead of interpreting the law as it is. And uh, I think it would also undermine the court's legitimacy uh, because it would, it, it, such a decision would be ignored and criticized by the states with nuclear weapons, and that it would not be to the benefit of the court uh, and its, and its uh, sense of legitimacy. Um, and finally, the work of eliminating nuclear weapons uh, requires the very difficult process of negotiating a treaty uh, that, 
accomplishes that elimination of nuclear weapons. It has to, that, that negotiation has to involve the states that have nuclear weapons. You can't do it by simply having this, all of the states that don't have nuclear weapons to get together and say that they're illegal. And it involves the very difficult task of coming up with intrusive, effective verification measures that all the states are prepared to live with. Because if you eliminate nuclear weapons, it becomes even more important to be able to detect at the outset that a country is breaking out of the treaty. Because if, every, if nobody has nuclear weapons, then the one state that breaks out and has one or a handful of nuclear weapons gets an outsized advantage over all the others. And no state is going to go down that road unless uh, none of the states with nuclear weapons are going to go down that road unless they have absolute confidence that uh, it, any such breakout would be detected. And there, there is no, in my view, no credible shortcut to accomplishing the elimination of nuclear weapons other than that long and difficult um, treaty process. And that's it.